Good afternoon, everyone. Mindfulness meditation for stress reduction, which all of us needs in today's day and time, is the topic of this session with Thomas Fondre. Thomas is a mindful meditation and stress reduction teacher and coach at Stanford's Cancer Clinic, as well as a lot of other locations in San Francisco Bay Area. I'm Amita from Nourish Talk. I would like to welcome Thomas, who's joining us live from mountains of Los Gatos, California, live. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you, Amita. So nice to be with you today. Uh, despite the smoky skies and turmoil in our world, it's, it's great to be with you talking a little bit about stress reduction, something we all need. So I'm going to jump right in and uh, share about just this topic that I'm very passionate about. And I love uh, working with people, individuals, and groups, really in any setting. It's uh, this modality of mindfulness-based stress reduction has just been really invaluable to me. And over the six years of teaching, just allowed me to get uh, connected and supportive of people dealing with myriad types of, of suffering in life. And as I like to say, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional with these wonderful tools. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of a background to start off with. I'd like to share about this human condition that we are all living in right now and these very complicated lives that we live and societies that we live in. But we started out as you know, very primitive hunter-gatherers and uh, with this really elaborate uh, nervous system, this fight-flight-freeze nervous system that just allowed us to fast track to the top of the food train, uh, chain. Uh, and this system, just incredible and responsible for making us super strong when we're being tracked down and hunted uh, super fast when we need to make the kill. Uh, adrenaline and cortisol rushing through our bodies, uh, moving, moving fluids around, blood around, and basically uh, just an, an, an enormous uh, benefit and uh, power that we have. But so fast forward, and here we are, we're no longer part of the food chain, uh, but we oftentimes think we are on an emotional level, and our nervous system doesn't really know if we're getting hunted um, and it releases these micro doses of cortisol and adrenaline, but mostly due to psychological and uh, social challenges, challenges that we have with our families and at work, uh, and just managing all of the responsibilities in, in our lives. And basically, we're all living with massive amounts of toxic stress, which will break us down. Uh, it's just inevitable. It's not if, but when. Samita, we'll go to the next slide. Sure. So there's this wonderful uh, revolution occurring in America or throughout the world right now with these ancient tools that are being used in a secular fashion. These contemplative tools from the wisdom traditions in the East and the West uh, being utilized for conditions that modern medicine really felt was uh, kind of it's a, a big challenge, right? And so John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts about 40 years ago uh, created Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, at the program, an eight-week program to help people grappling with chronic pain, end-of-life challenges, mental, emotional challenges, depression, and the like. And he saw results where no other uh, arena of medicine was able to find results. So uh, fast forward, and here we are uh, today. And uh, he's basically the father of modern mindfulness. Uh, he, uh, his programs are now being used in facilities throughout the United States in uh, medical settings and in sports settings in the military and indeed corporations who uh, are looking just basically wherever human beings are gathering together and stressing themselves out, they can find benefits uh, through these uh, tools. And also there's this wonderful just uh, amount of, of apps and of uh, videos and uh, teachers that are proselytizing these great, uh, great tools and I'm one of them. 
we'll go on to the next one. So as I mentioned, uh, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional with these tools and practices. So that was the big aha for me. So my breakdown was all around massive burnout more than 10 years ago. It was very clinical. I had hypertension. I had uh, irregular heartbeat problems, swallowing. I had skin problems. I couldn't sleep, about you know, a few other things going on too. And basically I was, uh, I was fast tracking to an early grave. I was really in, in bad shape. And I took the eight week class of mindfulness-based stress reduction and I uh, was immediately struck uh, by, in a profound way, uh, that I was really exacerbating a lot of my challenges with the way I was thinking, how I was ruminating on the past and in the future, never in the present moment, and basically totally in my head, and, and not in my body. And basically that's the kind of normal human condition. We're lost in thought and a lot of it is, uh, is negative and it's really not our fault. Again, that's our uh, inheritance from you know, our, uh, our, our incredible nervous systems and uh, our, uh, just how our brain works. So the first big win for me was learning how to really get myself to sleep. And that was huge. That is huge. In the, in the world of wellness, it's, it's the number one thing now. Uh, being able to get a good night's sleep comes before exercise and diet. And so that was my big win. And then as I continued to practice and learn and teach what I wanted to learn more, I've uh, just basically revamp the way I live with myself and the way I live with pain. And again, this pain is inevitable. Oftentimes we wanna resist pain and that's our natural impulse too. Why is this happening to me? How long is, am I gonna feel this way? We equate feeling bad with being bad. We're not doing life right. And uh, this little paradigm shift, it's not just little, it's massive to just be with our pain, to move towards our pain and get to know it as energy, not this onerous thing, to notice that there is an ebb and flow of pain, a beginning, middle and end. And of course, if you have chronic pain, it's a whole different uh, uh, reality. It's a much more a deep challenge, but it can be supported, helped, carried, contained within this practice in a very uh, supportive, compassionate, kind way. And that's a bit of a paradigm shift for the human experience too, because we're so inclined and we're so conditioned to nose to the grindstone, not to be very nice to ourselves, to just run ourselves into the ground too much. So that's another big shift going on with these practices. So we'll look at the next slide. So yes, just a nurturing a different relationship with ourselves mentally, emotionally, and physically. So pain is inevitable. The story we tell ourselves, blew it, can't believe I screwed up like that at work, can't believe I let myself down in A, B, or C ways. Um, emotionally tied to the conditioning that we've had, the wounds that we've suffered in the past, and indeed physically, and indeed the biggest stress in life comes around a physical illness and aging. But then we're just carrying uh, these things with just this inevitability, morning, noon, and night, we're experiencing pain, bumping our head, telling ourselves a story about it, creating more pain and suffering in our lives. And so it's just, uh, it's a whole new thing, moving towards, instead of being aversive, and the aversive turns into wanting to run away, and that's what fuels addictions or hide away, isolation, escape, depression is, fat, is where we're going to fast track there. Or it is aggression, hard on ourselves, hard on others, and uh, the relationship changes to change all of that, which is basically fight, flight, freeze, externally turned internally, okay? And we get to, uh, to treat it in a different way. Get to know our pain. Get curious about our pain. Be with our pain. Drop out of our heads and into our hearts and experience a certain wisdom, a spaciousness around our pain, 
understanding again that it's ebbing and flowing that it's not a constant and indeed understanding that everything in the present moment is changing and that uh, we're just more apt to not believe all of our thinking too and really understand our minds too it's this profound thing best way to understand your mind is to sit down and watch it and that's what these practices are about sometimes called meditation called other things as well too We'll go on to the next slide. So a little uh, optimism here. Basically, I encourage everyone to give these practices a try like your life depends on it because I think it does. I think it's just epidemics of stress leading to all these challenges in the human experience and it's an epidemic. I mean, kids fast tracking to depression and suicidal ideation that's a population that I work with uh, professionally. And indeed, all these other things in the human experience, addiction and uh, anxiety. Uh, anyway, we're all experiencing some degree of it. Uh, but when we practice these things, we, we fortify uh, greater contentment in the, in the here and now, greater life satisfaction, and actually fueling energy and motivation when we be befriend ourselves and we become a real effective uh, counselor in a way, our own wisest counsel, because nobody knows us better than we know ourselves, it just fuels uh, a, a different level of power in the, in the present moment. We're able to get out of our limited and kind of contracted way of looking at ourselves in the world and see things big picture, see things more wisely have more flexibility, cope better, have uh, greater resilience. Our immune system absolutely responds in the positive. Uh, physical health and longevity. Whatever time you put into these practices, you're gonna get in on the back end. You will live longer. And I like to say that, you know, 50 years ago, nobody was in the gyms working out. You know, it's like, what are you running from? Like, uh, you know, who's chasing you? Everybody's running now. You know, so and the same with uh, mindfulness, just like with exercise, the science backs it up. It's awesome for us it's mentally, emotionally, physically. And the same with uh, these practices, mentally and mostly and emotionally and physically, the, the science validates its, uh, its usefulness, its benefit to us. We will live longer. The science backs that up. Yeah, Amita. Now, I, I was just going to say that all these uh, issues that have, uh, you know, happened, like why we are depressed, why are we so stressed out, you know, this is also the, you know, one is the lifestyle, which, which you are talking about. And then the other is also uh, so many other things, right? The society that we are more isolated, we are more nuclear families, which just happened all over the world, not only in the United States, right? And then the food and, and the style. So all that has culminated into all these issues. And how do you now bring it back together the way we were growing up? You know, that society, I remember, you know, and I'm sure you remember too, yeah. is that the 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 community feeling of living and, and playing and you know just just that how do you bring that whole society back is is to me that that's like the root cause is why it has happened one of the root causes not the only root cause I agree I agree we're so spread out you know and then isolated and uh, connection family connection friend connection uh, we're all feeling that intensely right now as we're more isolated with the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, a, it's one of those things. I came to that realization. I went for my goals. My ego was driving me to go to the East Coast, and the West Coast, and to Europe, and then back here again. And then I had a child. And I'm like, oh, now what? I want to be close to my family. What have I done? <laughs> I'm like, uh, so uh, the, we get into these discussions with the practice and um, the... Uh, the things I like to espouse uh, for mental health in the present moment, uh, COVID-19 mental health is uh, getting moved. So practicing mindfulness, moving your body, meaningful connections. We got to have them. We can't isolate. Getting out in the community, meeting people, finding an exercise partner, connecting with the person at the grocery store, seeing people, and uh, personally, 
subjectively, my experience has been I'm less isolated now that I've practiced uh, for, for these years with, with these wonderful tools, self-compassion being a huge thing, loving kindness. Um, my heart has opened up and I'm, I'm, I see people now. I was so into my head before, so into my goals and my ego got out of my head, got into my heart, and a certain something happened where I, I just, I see people, I wanna connect with people. There's this common humanity, empathy, connection with people that I have now that I never had uh, before, really, or I didn't have to this degree uh, before. So I agree with you, it's one of the most important things we need, and I do hope we get back to that more kind of close-knit community, family, nuclear family. Uh, we need to, we need our elders around. We need uh, we need their wisdom. We need uh, we need connection. Should we move on to the next slide? Yes, yeah, sure. So basically, the practice boils down to this phrase. Uh, this is from John Kabat-Zinn: "Paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally." Non-judgmental awareness of the present moment informs the practice of either watching things in the present moment, generally through our senses. So it's our breath, it's our body sensations, it's sounds in the present moment. It can be an open awareness where we're looking at all those things and indeed looking at the mind as well. So I'll move on to the next slide, Amita. So yes, this is simple but not easy. Uh, when we've spent our whole lives in our, you say this default network, this is a part of the brain where we're time traveling, we're in the future or in the past, ruminating about challenges in our lives, being strategic, goal-oriented, very critical part of, of living and surviving in the world. But when we become responsible adults, we spend most of our time, if not all of our time, there. I shouldn't say all of our time. You know, there's moments of, we've all had them, of, of freedom and connection and awe, being in nature and having good times, being free. And we all know what de-stresses de us, you know, the love of music, the love of hiking and sports and myriad things. But a big chunk of our rumination is, is that negative thing, that rumination around the things that aren't working in our lives. And so this practice allows us to get out of that default network in the mind, drop into the present moment and practice being in the present moment, practice. What our mind wants to do is run away. What's coming up next? What's for dinner? What happened today at work, et cetera? Myriad things too. So that's the practice, okay? We'll look at the next slide, Amita. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of the things that I teach, uh, formal and informal meditation. I like to call it mind conditioning or mind training. It's not woo-woo. This is just very basically out of our mind and bringing the focus of our attention, just imagining a flashlight of our attention to the sensations in our hand or in our shoulder or in the soles of our feet or the sound that is happening in the present moment, the fan that's on, the, the, the car horn, the neighbor's dog, the door slamming, and just letting these things pass our awareness. So awareness is like the background reality of our lives. And then our other reality is this thing that's informed by our story, our narrative, our ego, etc. cetera. And that, that's tied to that default network in the mind. And so when we start to look at the, the present moment through our senses, we get in touch with that deep awareness side of things, dip our toes into it. And then we, we feel the qualities of, of equanimity, peace, spaciousness, compassion, 
love, curiosity. Yeah. So, and a lot of other great things. So it's getting to know that space, but it's hard. The mind runs away. And another thing I love to clarify with patients coming uh, new to mindfulness and meditation is, oh, I tried it. I can't stop my mind. No way. It's not for me. My mind's too active. Got this big brain. Well, we all have these big brains and they're wonderful tools. Um, and they're going to think. So the mind thinks like the nose smells, the lungs breathe. Okay. So in a practice period, the mind is going to go. And when you see where it's been and catch it in that wherever, you gently bring it back. And that's a good moment right there because you are in the present moment. You're bringing the mind back in the present moment. This one breath, this one sound, this one body sensation. Leave, come back, leave, come back, leave, come back like a barbell rep for your attention, staying in attention. But it takes practice like anything. Got to put in the time. A minute counts, two minutes. Time yourself, increase, get better. And you certainly will get better. And then ultimately you'll realize it's like, wow, that's a good place to be. And it, uh, there's ripple effects of so many benefits in your life. But I like people to stay skeptic you know you better than anyone. Just give it a try. Keep practicing. Keep returning and learning. As I've, I've worked with John Kabat-Zinn a few times over the, over the years, and that's, that was his words to me back like seven years ago. Just keep, going to the, just keep going to the cushion. Just keep practicing, increasing your time. Go to the retreats. Read the books. But I like to say... An ounce of practice is worth a pound of theory. We can get all addicted to the books and reading about these wonderful deep topics. But the book inside your heart is the most important thing. Your struggles, your pain, your sadness, your inevitability of getting old and passing, you know, getting to know, getting to appreciate the present moment, and certainly. Lots of other good things uh, come with that. So we'll look at the last uh, slide, I believe. Yeah, okay, well, this is, this is our final slide, but I wanted to also talk just about other things that come into play with uh, mindful self-compassion being one of the key things. Um, learning to befriend ourselves, uh, acknowledge our common humanity, that we're all just trying to be happy in life, and, uh, we get to befriend ourselves a little bit more. And that's a huge paradigm shift. We all talk about a good talk about that, but these tools help you learn how to do that. And I also like to talk about gladdening the mind. So it's not our fault that we default to the negative. Like if we go down to the mall, we're gonna you know, hit, when we used to go to the mall, six different clerks buying different things, etc. But that one clerk who was rude to us, we're going to remember that, we're going to talk about it, we're going to ruminate about it, how could he, she, etc. All the good experiences, the nice experiences that we had, we're not going to track. So that's just the way our, our minds work. They are Teflon for the positive, Velcro for the negative. So I like to gladden the mind we talk about gratitude journals, being very intentional about noting the good things that happened during the day, what you're grateful for and why. Keeping track of those, getting to know those, then you begin to see them. You're training your mind to see them. Very critical thing just to help out with our day-to-day our -day, uh, well-being and appreciation for this wonderful gift that we have in life. Uh, that we often miss because we're so wrapped up in the overdoing and overthinking. So that's basically what's, what it's all about for me. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And, and, and rightfully said, you know, you said we all of us have a very hard time letting go of some negative things or negative experiences that we've had, you know, whether it has been our childhood experience or whether it has been whatever. So, so, that's, so that's, I think it's so important to train, how do you get those bad, bad feelings out of your brain, right? Because th th it happens to all of us. So, so, so you think by doing mindful uh, meditation on a regular basis can get the negative feelings out of our brains? That's what you're saying, right? 
Yeah, well, it's not that they're not going to come. Okay. I still struggle. I still uh, let myself down. I still drop back into my, my patterns. The shift has been to just see it coming and to lessen the amount of time that I'm beating myself up about something, regretting something. And so whereas back in the day, I could have been trapped in uh, self-pity or negative rumination, uh, anger, frustration for a few hours, a few days. I mean, the biggies would just be there a lot you know, of, of time, could be months, years. Uh, it's now I see it, I see how it's affecting me. I see where my mind is going, the story that I'm telling myself and I'm able to stop it uh, sooner. Yeah. Rather than later. Yeah. 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 That's, you know, so the, the, yeah. that's the trick, I think. The Dalai Lama was asked about that too, or other people who, who practice uh, mindfulness at an expert level. And they say that, that very thing. They just see it coming and they don't even open the door. I mean, I still open the door. I mean, it's still like, wow. Um, this is a moment of suffering, the common humanity, mm -hmm. get mindful about it, get big picture about it, and then start to get kinder to myself about it. And it's not like it's going to go like, go away just like that. It's just, uh, again, pain is inevitable. It's going to come at us in myriad ways, the small, medium, and large things. Right around the corner, it's inevitable. We're all going to get hammered by life uh, sometimes. But with these tools, we're able to be a friendlier to ourselves. And I would say stress less. And some people get a stress attack and they fast track to the hospital. It's so debilitating. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for your talk. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you can offer some classes, workshops, uh, you know, in the near future. Um, to help all of us uh, control our negative emotions, which I think most of us need to learn that, uh, that you know, the, the ability, how do we keep ourselves positive despite all the negative things that are going around us. Yes, that's so true. Just that, uh, just a little bit more positive, a little bit more uh, understanding and acknowledging that pain is inevitable and uh, not, not beating ourselves up uh, about it, and believing that we're bad just because we are suffering. You yeah. know, uh, just the normalizing is that big piece, yeah. So such a pleasure. I, I so look forward to sharing these tools uh, more with more, uh, more people in need. I do think this is a, a wonderful revolution, you know, in the human experience to help us evolve and come together. Uh, but it's like, I like to say, think globally, but act locally between your ears to become uh, kinder, more compassionate uh, so that we can be more of who we uh, need to be in the world and, and come together. Well, thank you so much with that thought of compassion. Uh, um, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we will thank you to our viewers who will be watching this uh, you know, show. And let us know of, of your feedback of all our sessions. With that, signing off, this is Amita. And have a great weekend. Bye.